All right. So our lecture tonight is, and I don't mean to be sacrilegious, but Kill Jehovah, the true meaning of the Epic of Gilgamesh. And my purpose in giving this lecture is to give Christians some tools to understand the Epic of Gilgamesh before you start reading it yourself. Because if you understand who the people were and why, the whole thing makes a lot more sense. And so I'm going to make the case for you that Gilgamesh was the first of the post-flood Nephilim. And quoting from Genesis 6-4, it says, There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. And Gilgamesh is definitely a man of renown, and so he's not named by name in the Bible, but I believe that he is one of the ones, uh, and also afterward, who this is referring to. So what is the Epic of Gilgamesh? When archaeologists started digging in Babylon and Assyria at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, they found a number of tablets that had a story on it. They, had, they found thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of tablets written in the cuneiform language. But a certain number of them had religious texts, and they found this particular one called the Epic of Gilgamesh. And this tells how a, a hero named Gilgamesh fought a monster named Huawa, or in the Assyrian version, Humbava, which is, in some languages, the W turns into a B or a V. And it also has a version of the flood and how humanity was saved from a flood that destroyed everything in a boat. And this story was wildly popular in the ancient Near East. And it also made quite a, a stir when it was discovered at the end of the 19th century. You had um, a lot of skeptics of the Bible saying, aha, here's the proof that Genesis was copied from the Babylonians. It's not, Genesis is not the original story. The Babylonian story is older, and here is proof. We, we will make the case that is not, in fact, the reality. So why is Gilgamesh significant? It is extremely significant to the authenticity of the Bible. So on the one hand, it affirms the authenticity of the Bible, that there was a global flood, and that there was one family who was saved from that flood by building a boat and by taking animals in, and it even includes the details of the, of the doves being sent out and the doves coming back with the olive branch. The problem is it's also being used to attack the Bible because it claims that this is older than the Bible. So the alternate hypothesis that I want to present to you this evening is that the Epic of Gilgamesh as a piece of literature was written about two centuries after the events that it describes and that the purpose was to erase the memory of the God Jehovah who sent the flood by replacing him with a new flood story that, that deletes him. Now, this picture right here is a mask of Huawa. And the Babylonians and the Assyrians and the Sumerians, they viewed Huawa as the bad guy, this evil ogre that Gilgamesh killed. And so they made masks and they celebrated the killing of Huawa. And just to put this in perspective, this would be like people since Christ came celebrating the death of Christ. That is how serious it is. So who was Gilgamesh? The king of Uruk. Uh, he was a king of Uruk and also Egypt. And he's found in four different ancient king lists that are not the Epic of Gilgamesh, but he is found in these lists so we know he was a real historical person. In the Sumerian king list, king list, his name is written Gilgamesh. In the Nineveh king list, given to us by Tessius, he is called Ninyas Zemes. And the Zemes appears to be a corruption of the Gilgamesh. So Gamesh got turned into Zamesh. So it's the same name. And he has the same length of reign of 38 years. Manitho's first, first dynasty of Egypt has him listed as Mubius. And... We also might know his Egyptian name. It might be Den 
And there's a couple of other possibilities. He could be Jet or Jer in the first dynasty of Egypt. And we also have him mentioned in the Irish Annals. The, uh, the books of the Four Masters mention him. And the, amazingly, the Irish information, which you would think would be Middle Ages, it corroborates information found in Manetho as well as the Sumerian king list, which suggests that all three of those records are true records about a real person. And in this depiction, you can see him holding a lion. And it's very obvious that this guy is about 14 feet tall. And we will see from the description of his weapons that he would have to be a very big man. The meaning of Gilgamesh, the literal meaning of that name is the beloved ancestor has become a young man or warrior. And this is significant because Gilgamesh in the Egyptian um, in the Egyptian mythology, he's called Horus, the younger. And he was believed to be the reincarnation of either Osiris or Horus the Elder, who, uh, Horus the Elder, I believe, to be based on Cain. So the, the Egyptians seem to have believed he was the reincarnation of Cain. And his name in Sumerian means the reincarnation of a beloved ancestor. And we'll, as we go through this, we will see why and probably who the ancestor would be. Of course, I'm not saying that he was reincarnated, but they believed he was. So when did Gilgamesh live and reign? Based on the information in those king lists, as well as several of the Greek, the Greek chroniclers dated uh, the Assyrian Empire as beginning with his reign or with his death. And so he was born about a decade or so after Nimrod was killed in 2068 B.C., his co-reign with his mother began in 2006 B.C., and uh, Noah died in 1998 B.C., according to Usher's chronology. Abraham was born in 1996 B.C., according to Usher's chronology, and then uh, Gilgamesh, his sole reign, meaning his mother died, began in 1994, and then he finally died in 1968 B.C. when Abraham was about 26 years old. Now, the, um, the Muslims and the Jews have a legend that Abraham fought against Nimrod, or Abraham outsmarted Nimrod, who tried to burn him in a furnace because Nimrod was forcing everyone to worship idols. Chronologically, Abraham and Nimrod did not live at the same time, but Gilgamesh was also called Ninus, which means little Ninus, and Nimrod was called Ninus. And so I think that the, the legends of the persecution of Abraham by Nimrod are based on the life of Gilgamesh. And we will see why. So the key to understanding Gilgamesh, we have to go back a few generations in Genesis before the flood. As you recall, in Genesis chapter 4, the line of Cain is listed and we have all the generations and interestingly, the final generation of the line of Cain, we are given a whole lot of information that is not given for any of the other generations. We're told Lamech, the names of his wives, the names of his kids, the things his kids discovered and did. And I believe the reason for that is one of his children was a passenger on the ark. So Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. Wise of Lamech, listen to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me even a young man, for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Lamech took for himself two wives, and the name of one was Ada, and the name of the second was Zillah, and Ada bore Jabel. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all the, those who play the harp and flute. And as for Zillah, she also bore Tubal-Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. And the sister of Tubal-Cain was Naama. This on the right is a portrait of a woman called Merneith from Egypt, who I believe that is an actual portrait of Naama. I don't think she was born with the vulture in her hair or the snakes, but it kind of gives you the vibe of what she was into. Some of the names of Niyama in history would be Semiramis, the Lady of Doves, 
connected to the dove being released on the ark. Isis, the Egyptian goddess. Demuzi, which is a man, but apparently there is some evidence um, recorded by some of the church fathers in the 2nd through the 4th centuries that when she was ruling after the death of Nimrod, it was not considered proper for a man to rule. So she would dress up as a man, and she claimed that um, this thing had happened where either she was in the netherworld or her lover was in the netherworld, but they couldn't both be out at the same time. And I suspect that, that came out of her dressing up as a man and pretending to be Demuzi, but then when she wanted to be herself, she dressed as a woman, and now Demuzi's in the underworld. I'm not sure to what degree that actually happened while she was reigning, but that's the story they made up. And in the, later in the Bible, it talks about women cutting themselves for Tammuz. Tammuz is another version of Demuzi, which is a lamentation for the death of Nimrod. So, at any rate, she's also called Astarte, or Ishtar. She's called Inanna, and in the Bible, she's called Asherah. So the Asherah poles that the Old Testament prophets were so offended by those were basically objects of worship of this woman as a goddess. And in the Greek mythology, she is Athena, but she's also probably about five other goddesses. She's, she's, she is most of the goddesses <laughs> that were worshipped in the ancient world were based on her. So the evidence uh, given by a number of scholars, and granted this can't be proved beyond a shadow of a doubt, but... Um, John Gill was the first Christian scholar in recent times who said that basically the wife of Ham was Naama. He believes that she was his wife. The Muslims have a legend that Naama was the wife of Noah. Uh, that's in the Quran, and I think also the Jews have, some Jews think that. I tend to side with the idea that she was the wife of Ham. And this, by the way, is an image of Ham, of Ham not Naama. Um, they worshipped Ham under a number of different names. So that's one of the, I think that's the god um, Enki, which was one of the names they worshipped Ham as an, an ancestor. So some evidence we have from the Epic of Gilgamesh is that Naama was extremely bitter at the death of her family. And now I'm quoting from one passage in, in the work. One day, the, one whole day, the tempest raged, referring to the flood. Gathering fury as it went, it poured over the people like the tides of battle. An imam could not see his brother, nor the people could be seen from heaven. Even the gods were terrified at the flood. They fled to the highest heaven, the firmament of Anu. They crouched against the walls, cowering like curs. Then Ishtar, the sweet-voiced queen of heaven, cried out like a woman in travail. Alas, the days of old are turned to dust, because I commanded evil why did I command thus evil in the council of all the gods? I commanded wars to destroy the people, but they are not my people, for I brought them forth. But now, like the spawn of fish, they float in the ocean. The great gods of heaven and hell wept, and they covered their mouths. I think the translation on this is a little bit iffy. But essentially, the Babylonians, writing this Epic of Gilgamesh two or three centuries after it happened, they now have a theology that they have to fit it into. And in their theology, the gods are eternal. And so their god Anu is their deified Noah. Their god Ishtar is their deified Naama. And so this is from the part where they've removed the name of the god Jehovah. And now they've made that it's that the, the ancestor gods decreed the flood. But they also managed to record that, it, that Ishtar herself, or Naama, was extremely upset that her people were now like the spawn of fish that float in the ocean, meaning the flood drowned them all and their corpses were floating in the sea. So she's greatly distressed that the flood happened. We have, um, this is a passage from, uh, I believe it's John of Niku. He was a uh, Christian 4th century chronicler, but this is also uh, found in Justice and Pompeius Trogus. It tells us that, um, it says, Ampicus, moreover, that is Zeus, was the first to take his sister to wife, and he begat by her a son named Belus, who resembled his grandfather Cronus. And this Belus ruled in Assyria after the disappearance of his father and his grandfather Cronus. 
And him also, after his death, the Persians worshipped with the gods. And then after the death of Belus, Ninus, who is Nimrod, his father's brother reigned over Assyria. He married Semiramis, his mother, and made her his wife, and established this impure custom and transmitted it to his successors. And they are designated by this evil name till the present day. This conduct does not create a scandal amongst the Persians, for they take to wife their mothers and sisters and daughters. So this is the weirdest, creepiest, and darkest thing in the story of Naama. Well, maybe second most. It appears that she, in her bitterness against the God who sent the flood, and her bitterness against Noah, decided to raise up the line of Cain again from herself, And she appears to have, according to this passage, as well as several others, she appears to have married her son Cush later. And in the Bible, when it says Cush begot Nimrod, it doesn't list Nimrod with his normal sons. It kind of lists him later, and it uses a different word for begot. And so it appears that she had Nimrod with her son Cush. And then, after Cush was gone, she married Nimrod. And the Egyptians... Well, the Egyptians kind of fudged it a little bit. They said that, that the, the Nimrod figure, Osiris, was married to his sister as opposed to being married to his mother. But this, this is how creepy she was. Okay. So Nimrod gets killed, and there are actually records of the date of his death. We have records from both the uh, Assyrians, the Sumerian king list, and the Egyptian first dynasty. And after he was killed, the Egyptians actually say that she, um, she recovered the pieces of his body because he had been cut up and the pieces sent out to all the kingdoms of the world, which kind of reminds us of a certain passage in the Bible where that was done. So she goes and she collects all the parts and she puts them all back together. And then, according to the Egyptians, she used black magic to impregnate herself and gives birth to Gilgamesh, who she claimed was the reincarnation, or, I'm sorry, Horus, who is the reincarnation of the ancestor. Now, to the Egyptians, Horus is the reincarnation of Osiris, or Nimrod. But to the, um, the Babylonians, he seems to be the reincarnation of uh, Cain. So maybe it was one, maybe it was both. I'm not exactly sure how their theology worked on that. So now, let's, now that I've given a, a background for when you read the Epic of Gilgamesh, let's look at the actual text as a piece of literature. There are six major sections. So Gilgamesh rules as a tyrant over the city of um, Uruk. I wrote Kish, I meant Uruk. That's the first section. And so we see him behaving in a very, very extremely immoral way. But the, the worldview of the book does not judge him as being immoral. It just judges him as being excessive. And so the gods make him a companion named Enkidu, who's kind of an ape man, a wild man, who's all hairy, like Chewbacca, and lives in the forest. And they bring him basically to the city, and he wrestles Gilgamesh and then becomes his best friend. And then the two of them decide they need something constructive to do because they're bored. So they set out to kill Huwawa, who is the guardian of the cedar forest. And after they come back victorious, the next section, his, the goddess Ishtar wants to marry Gilgamesh. And as I've just explained, Ishtar was his mother. And I've also explained that Ish- Naama had married her first two son, two of her sons in a row. And in the Epic of Gilgamesh, she proposes to Gilgamesh, who would be her third son, and he says, nope, and he kills her. So we actually have two records. We have three records of this. The Assyrians recorded it, and they say that she proposed, and he killed her for, for, for that act. The um, Epic of Gilgamesh says that she proposed, but instead it's his friend who dies. It doesn't say that he killed her. And then the Egyptian legend of um, Set... Uh, I'm sorry, Horus fighting Set, he accidentally chops the head of Hathor off. And so the Egyptian also records that he killed her. So then after his friend dies, 
he is suddenly strict smitten with the fear of death, and so he goes on this journey to find someone named Utu Napishtim, who is the survivor of the flood, and this man is said to have been given eternal life. And so Gilgamesh goes looking for this guy, he finds him, and this Utu Napishtim tells him the flood story, but this flood story no longer has Huwawa, Huwawa is erased from it, and we have a new flood story where the gods are the ones that send the flood, and the gods are the deified ancestors. And then he comes home and he dies. So now let's look at the actual text of the epic. So the prologue, it really is wonderful to, to listen to. This is very well written epic poetry, although it doesn't really rhyme. I will proclaim to the world the deeds of Gilgamesh. This was the man to whom all things were known. This was the king who knew the countries of the world. He was wise. He saw mysteries and knew secret things. He brought us a tale of the days before the flood. He went on a long journey, was weary, worn out with labor. Returning, he rested. He engraved, engraved on a stone the whole story. So now in the, the first section where Gilgamesh is in Uruk, you may remember from the film Braveheart, the evil, the evil English king issues a, a decree of prima nocta, which means that the king or his nobles or soldiers are allowed to claim the first night with any bride who gets married. Now, there is no evidence in history that the English ever did anything like that, and I'm not sure why they put that in Braveheart, but Gilgamesh did exactly that, and this is where that would come from. And the gods heard their lament. The gods of heaven cried to the Lord of Uruk and to Anu, the god of Uruk, a goddess made him, strong as a savage bull. None can withstand his arms. No son is left with his father, for Gilgamesh takes them all. And this is the king, the shepherd of his people. His lust leaves no virgin to her lover, neither the warrior's daughter nor the wife of the noble. When Anu had heard their lamentation, the gods cried out to Anu, the goddess of creation. Excuse me, they cried out to uh, Aruru, the goddess of creation. You made him, O Aruru. Now create his equal, let it be as, as like him, as his own reflection. His second self, stormy heart for stormy heart, let them contend together and leave Uruk in quiet. So the gods basically decide, we're not judging his morality, but this is excessive. That's the worldview that they're operating from. So let's make someone to distract him. And so they create this other um, kind of demigod, ape man called uh, Enkidu. Now the reason this is relevant is Gilgamesh's behavior, and this is only eight, nine generations after the flood. His behavior is, I'm king, therefore I can take any woman I want. Married, unmarried, doesn't matter. I, I get them all. And when Abraham, who was born about uh, six years into his reign, when Abraham comes to Egypt, about 30 years after the death of Gilgamesh, this has now become the practice of monarchs, of kings. And so not only is he afraid of this in, e in Egypt, he is afraid of this from Abimelech, who is a Philistine reigning in, in Canaan. So Gilgamesh practicing prima nocta gives us some background as to why Abraham was very concerned about this when he had a beautiful wife and went to a city with a, with a king. So the gods make Enkidu the ape man. His body was rough. He had long hair like a woman's. It waved like the hair of Nisaba, the goddess of corn. His body was covered in matted hair like Samugans, the god of cattle. He was innocent of mankind. He knew nothing of the cultivated land. I'm going to skip the part where they tame him by sending, they send a prostitute out to the woods to seduce him and bring him back. And so he becomes civilized. He wears clothes and he comes and he comes to fight Gilgamesh. Now, they're complaining now about Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh does strange things in Uruk, the city of great streets. At the roll of the drum, work begins for the men and work for the women. Gilgamesh, the king, is about to celebrate marriage with the queen of love, meaning the goddess Ishtar, whose love makes him king, according to their religion. And yet he still demands to be first with the bride, the king to be first and the husband to follow, for that was ordained by the gods from his birth, from the time the umbilical cord was cut. 
But now the drums roll for the choice of the bride, and the city groans. At these words, Enkidu turned white in the face. I will go to the place where Gilgamesh lords it over the people. I will challenge him boldly, and I will cry aloud in Uruk, I have come to change the old order, for I am the strongest here. Well, Enkidu comes and fights Gilgamesh, and they wrestle for hours, and neither one can beat the other. And they then strike, basically shake hands and decide that they are best friends. And now that they become best friends, uh, Enkidu complains that he is dying from boredom. So then we come to this passage. It was then that the Lord Gilgamesh turned his thoughts to the, to the land of the living. On the land of cedars, the Lord Gilgamesh reflected. He said to his servant Enkidu, I have not established my name stamped on bricks as my destiny decreed. Therefore, I will go to the country where the cedar is felled. I will set up my name in the place where the names of famous men are written and where no man's name is written, yet I will, wise, I will raise a monument to the gods. Because of the evil that is in the land, we will go to the forest and destroy the evil. For in the forest lives Humbava, whose name means hugeness, a ferocious giant. It goes on to tell us that Huawa was placed there by Enlil, who is the god that the, the Sumerians the name under which they worship Shem. And so we find that before he goes, he gets the blessing of Chemosh, or Shumash, who is a sun god. And in the Sumerian pantheon, the sun gods are usually uh, Ham. So Ham is called Utu, he's called Shemosh, or Chumash, and the Egyptians called him Ammon, or Amun-Ra. And... Um, the reason why Ham was probably named the sun god it seems to have been that he, in the century after the flood, they were exploring the world and trying to map it. And there is a reference in one of the uh, Sumerian kings. Later, there was a king who uh, went around the world. And he says, I went west with the sun and came back from the east like the sun, like Utu. And so... I, I can't prove this, but I suspect that the reason that Ham became worshipped as the sun god was that he's, he might have been the first to circumnavigate the world, and that he went to the west and he came back from the east. Uh, another comment about the land of the living. Um, there are a couple of other mentions of this place, and there are some other copies of the Epic of Gilgamesh which described this land of the living as a place where Huawa is surrounded by all these animals and, and the monkeys, and it says monkeys, and birds are singing a song, like a chorus, to him. And it, it sounds kind of like Jehovah being surrounded by his throne uh, of the angels uh, singing to him. But um, they also describe it, they say it's 10,000 um, leagues or 10,000 units across and uh, the site that I gave a lecture about last week, the ark site that I, I showed, appears to be about 10,000 Egyptian cubits. There's an area where there was nothing up there. There's a lot of things on the mountain to the north and to the south of it, but there's this, the one zone around the tomb appears to have had nothing there. And I suspect that it was a place where no hunting was allowed. Um, after the flood, man was given animals to eat. And if... There's only seven of each kind of animal, uh, seven pairs of the clean ones and two of the unclean ones. And where you got hungry, we might have killed them all and they went extinct. So I think the land of the living refers to a sacred place where no hunting was allowed, no trees were to be chopped down. You let the animals live here. This is the refugium from which they will refill the earth. And outside of that is you can hunt them and eat them. But the second would be, why would it be called the land of the living? If you were a passenger on the ark and the whole world was destroyed and the ark comes to rest on a mountain and you look out and you don't recognize this place, it looks completely barren and alien moonscape to you, where, where are we? And after some thought, they would come to the conclude, well, if everyone else is dead, then this must be the land of the living. And so that, I propose, is why it was called that. So he said to his servant Enkidu, I have not established my name. Oh, sorry, I already read that. 
Um, so Enkidu sighed bitterly and said, when I went with the wild beasts ranging through the wilderness, I discovered the forest. Its length is 10,000 leagues in every direction. And Lil has appointed, appointed Humbaba to guard it and armed him with sevenfold terrors. Terrible to all flesh is Humbaba. When he roars, it is like the torrent of the storm. His breath is like fire and his jaws are death itself. He guards the cedar so well that when the wild heifer stirs in the forest, although she is 60 leagues distant, he hears her. So Gilgamesh and Enkidu decide, yeah, we're going to go kill Huwawa, Humbaba. But before they go, they have to get ready, so they build special weapons. He went to the forge and said, I will give orders to the armorers. They shall cast us our weapons while we watch them. So they gave orders to the armorers, and the craftsmen sat down in conference. They went into the groves of the plain, and they cut willow and boxwood. They cast for them axes of stone, sorry, axes of nine score pounds, which is 180 pounds. And great swords they cast with blades of six score pounds, each one, which is 120 pounds, (laughs) with pommels and hilts of 30 pounds, which is putting the... um, the total weight of the weapons, <laughs> we're talking about 200 pounds, 180 to 200 pound swords and axes, which are in Goliath territory. They cast for Gilgamesh the axe, Might of Heroes, and the bow of Anshan. And Gilgamesh was armed in Enkidu, and the weight of the arms they carried was 30 score pounds, which is 600 pounds. So each of them was carrying 600 pounds of armor and weapons. Together they went down into the forest, and they came to the green mountain. There they stood still, and they were struck dumb. They stood still and gazed at the forest. They saw the height of the cedar. They saw the way into the forest and the track where Humbaba used to walk. The way was broad, and the going was good. They gazed at the mountain of cedars, the dwelling place of the gods, and the throne of Ishtar. Now, it's interesting, the actual text there says the dwelling place of the Anunnaki, which were the eight, the eight great gods of the Sumerians, who I believe are based, based on the eight passengers of the ark. So this is a very interesting detail, that if he's just going to some mountain to, to kill a monster, why is he encountering the dwelling place of the Anunnaki and the throne of Ishtar on his journey there? And I believe the reason is that he went to the, the mountain where the ark landed and where they had lived up there for 120 years before Babel. And he literally went to their dwelling places. And the throne of Ishtar would have been where Naama and Ham lived on the south end of the mountain. So it tells about the journey. After 20 leagues, they broke their fast. After another 30 leagues, they stopped for the night. 50 leagues they walked in one day. And in three days they had walked as much as a journey of a month and two weeks. They crossed seven mountains before they came to the gate of the forest. Now the mountain I'm going to show you has seven peaks, or has eight peaks, and they appear to have described it going from south to north. And the peak where the ark was is at the, the seventh peak. So this is a map of the Middle East. The city of Uruk is down here at the lower right the lower right corner. The mountain where I believe he went to kill Humbaba is up here in Turkey. And the route would have been up the river and then up the uh, Kibar River and then up along the mountain. He encounters the seven mountains. Then they chop down the trees and they take them to the Euphrates River and they float them all the way back down to the city of Uruk. And we know that this mountain had to be in the Euphrates watershed because it says that, in, it says that um, they cleared the trees all the way to the river so they could float the trees down. Now, most scholars tend to put this story in Lebanon because Lebanon is the mountain that most recently had cedars. But during the, what would be called the Ice Age, probably, the centuries after the flood, this part, the Taurus Mountains of Turkey, which this mountain is uh, a part of, They also have the same cedars of Lebanon. Even today, some of them still grow there. Now, this particular mountain is now barren because they've chopped all the trees down and the goats, 
they just have grazed it down to nothing. But this was an area where cedar trees used to grow. Oops. So together they went down into the forest and they came to the green mountain. There they stood still and they were struck dumb. I guess I read, I read this before. They saw the, site, the height of the cedar and they saw the way into the forest and the track where Humbaba was used to walk. The way was broad and the dwelling place was good and they gazed at the mountain of cedars, the dwelling place of the gods and the throne of Ishtar. So now zooming in on it, at the south end of this mountain is the um, stone village that I believe was probably what he means by the throne of Ishtar. And then the region at the north end, that's 10,000 cubits in diameter, is probably the, the land of the living, which was the sacred, the sacred place. And uh, this is the structure that I believe is what he's referring to as the throne of Ishtar. It, it's in the middle of that uh, stone village, and they appear to have built what would be called a tumulus, which is a mound or a tomb made of stones. And on top of it, there's a dome, which probably was built later by people worshiping. But this is um, the actual object that I think he was referring to. All right. Okay, so after he visits the throne of Ishtar, now he has the battle with Humbaba. When they had come down from the mountain, Gilgamesh seized the axe in his hand. He felled the cedar. When Hubava heard the noise far off, he was enraged. He cried out, Who is this that has violated my woods and cut down my cedar? But glorious Shamash called out to them of heaven, Go forward and do not be afraid. But now Gilgamesh was overcome by weakness, for sleep had seized him suddenly. A profound sleep held him. <clears throat> he lay on the ground stretched out speechless as though in a dream. When Enkidu touched him, he did not rise. When he spoke to him, he did not reply. O Gilgamesh, lord of the plain of Kulab, the world grows dark. The shadows have spread over it. Now is the glimmer of dusk. Shamash has departed. His bright head is quenched in the bosom of his mother, Ningal. O Gilgamesh, how long will you lie like this asleep? Never let the mother who gave you birth be forced in mourning into the city square. So, they then describe in great detail the battle. And here it's interesting that they depict Huwawa as a cherubim. So they describe him as a monster, but they, de they depicted him as a cherubim. And so here is Gilgamesh, and here is Enkidu. So after they kill Humbaba, and inter interestingly, Humbaba the monster says, Hey, don't kill me. I'll make you a place and we can have dinner. And they kill him anyway. So it, it's kind of a cold-blooded murder. It's not like he's actually fighting them. And I think it very much sounds more like a martyrdom. Also, they say, um, first, first get the, the hen, and then you can get the chicks. So they actually discuss killing not just Humbaba, but his followers. And that's why I believe that this is literally a, a murder of the priest of Jehovah and then a persecution of the followers of Jehovah. So when Gilgamesh comes back, it says, Gilgamesh washed out his long locks and cleaned his weapons. He flung back his hair from his shoulders. He threw off his stained clothes and changed them for new. He put on his royal robes and made them fast. When Gilgamesh had put on the crown, glorious Ishtar lifted her eyes. Seeing the beauty of Gilgamesh, she said, Come to me, Gilgamesh, and be my bridegroom. Grant me seed of your body and let me be your bride and you shall be my husband. I will harness for you a chariot of lapis lazuli and of gold with wheels of gold and horns of copper. And you shall have mighty demons of the storm for draft mules when you enter our house in the fragrance of cedar wood. The threshold and the throne will kiss your feet. Kings, rulers, and princes will bow down before you. They shall bring you tribute from the mountains and the plain. Your, your ewes shall drop twins and your goats triplets. Your pack ass shall outrun the mules and your oxen shall have no rivals. And your chariot horses shall be famous far off for their swiftness. Sounds like a good deal. Gilgamesh opened his mouth and answered the glorious Ishtar, If I take you in marriage, what gifts can I give in return? What ointments and clothing for your body? 
I would gladly give you bread and all sorts of food fit for a god. I would give you wine to drink fit for a queen. I would pour out barley to stuff your granary, but as for making you my wife, that I will not. How would it go with me? Your lovers have found you like a brazier which smolders in the cold, a back door which keeps out neither the squall of wind nor the storm, a castle which crushes the garrison, a pitch that blackens the bearer, a water skin that chafes the carrier, a stone which falls from the parapet, a battering ram turned back from the enemy, a sandal that trips the wearer. Which of your lovers did you ever love forever? What shepherd of yours has pleased you for all time? Listen to me while I, while I tell you the tale of your lovers. And then he proceeds to list about ten of her lovers and how she had burned them all. She did not appreciate this comment. When, when Ishtar heard this, she fell into a bitter rage. She went up to high heaven. Her tears poured down in front of her father, Anu. Again, Anu is the Noah figure that they've deified. And Antum, her mother. She said, My father, Gilgamesh, has heaped insults on me. He has told over all my abominable be- behavior, my foul and hideous acts. <laughs> he told me my, ha- my foul and hideous acts. Anu opened his mouth and said, Are you a father of the gods? Did you not quarrel with Gilgamesh the king? So now he has related your abominable behavior, your foul and hideous acts. Ishtar opened her mouth and said again, My father, give me the bull of heaven to destroy Gilgamesh. Fill Gilgamesh, I say, with the arrogance to his destruction. But if you refuse to give me the bull of heaven, I will break the doors of hell and smash the bolts, and there will be confusion of the people, those above with those from the lower depths. I shall bring up the dead to eat the living." And the host of the dead will outnumber the living. And Anusha to, said to great Ishtar, If I do what you desire, there will be seven years of famine throughout Uruk, where the corn will be seedless husks. Have you saved grain enough for the people and grass for the cattle? Ishtar replied, I have saved grain for the people and grass for the cattle. For seven years of seedless husks, there is grain and there is grass enough. Now this is very interesting because She's recording the first seven-year famine. And we find this famine recorded also in the, um, on the Pyramid of Djoser. He left an inscription about the seven-year famine. There's a legend uh, from Jacob of Edessa about Terah, the father of Abraham, that they had a seven-year famine during which Abraham was born. This is not the seven-year famine of Joseph. This is 300 years earlier. And this is the one that was so bad that they, they made this myth about it. And I suspect that the bull of heaven is a reference to the Taurid meteors. So the, the constellation Taurus is one of the constellations of the zodiac. And the sun, um, every November, when we get to uh, October 38th, sorry, October 28th to roughly November 1st, we pass through the Taurid meteor stream and we see all these meteors, uh, meteor showers. It is very probable that that is the remnant of the uh, whatever happened when the flood happened, that there was some kind of heavenly body that intersected with the earth at the time of the flood. And the debris from that continues to orbit the sun, and the earth passes through that debris stream every, every um, October, late October, and you have the Taurid meteors. Well, now most of the Taurid meteor pieces are small, although a couple of them are big. There's, there's one that's like a mile across that is of some concern to NASA that it might hit us. But I suspect that thousands of years ago there were some very big pieces of the Taurid meteor storm, and one of them struck the earth and caused a seven-year famine by the ash thrown up. And they basically mythologized it as... Ishtar used the bull of heaven against Gilgamesh, and Gilgamesh defeated the bull of heaven, which means the famine ended. But the, re- the reality is probably based on something like what I just described. The Egyptians have a similar story. They, except they call it the book of the heavenly cow. They say that the goddess Hathor, who is also based on Nyama, it's an Ishtar goddess, that the gods became angry, and so Hathor was asked to basically judge the people, and so she, she goes crazy and starts destroying everybody, causing a famine. But then 
she had become so drunk with blood that she, she couldn't snap out of it. So the, the gods had to figure out how to make her stop. So they, they took beer and they put um, food coloring in it to make it red. And thinking it was blood, she drinks the beer and then she passes out. And when she wakes up, she's back to her sweet self again. That's the Egyptian version of the story. So the reality of the story is probably there was a famine. It may have been related to a, a meteor or a comet hitting the earth. And that this was 300 years before Joseph. And because this famine made such a big impression on them, when Joseph goes down to Egypt and the king has this dream, and Joseph says, there's going to be a seven-year famine, everybody sits up straight and says, what? Another one? And that's why the king is totally ready to do whatever Joseph says, because they remembered the previous one, and it was legendary. So here we have um, Gilgamesh and Enkidu in the, in the epic. They supposedly kill the, the bull of heaven. And that makes the gods angry because the bull of heaven is divine. And so they, pun, they decree that Enkidu must die for his crime. So Enkidu dies, and Gilgamesh is very sad. And he becomes then obsessed with the idea of his own mortality. He, and, and again, this is right after the flood. Before the flood, people lived 800, 900 years. And right when this is, this is taking place, people are starting to die from the generation of Peleg and down. We're starting to see the first generations after the flood die. So he, his timing for becoming obsessed with mortality also happened to be the time that people suddenly realized, hey, we're not going to live to be 800 years old like we used to. So it fits the time. And I think I mentioned earlier that um, we have three versions of this story where the Gilgamesh figure kills his mother. In two of the versions, she proposes to marry him, and in two of the versions, he kills her. And the Assyrians are the only ones who say he killed her because she proposed to him. But the fact that you have the Assyrians, you have the Greeks, and you also have the Egyptians all recording this roughly the same story suggest that these are three witnesses that it really did happen. Sorry, here we go. So here's the Egyptian picture of Isis with Horus, her son, when he's grown. Actually, she's depicted as Hathor with the horns. And this is uh, either the moon or the sun is the disc between the horns, saying that she's a goddess. So this will be shortly before... They fell out, had a fight, and he kills her. So now that his friend has died, and he wants to find out about if he can live to be as old as the people before the flood, Gilgamesh decides to go looking for this person called Utu Napishtim, which means Utu found life. And he's the person that was told by the gods to build the ark and to survive the flood with all these people. And everyone has assumed that because this sounds very much like the story of Noah and the ark, that Utu Napishtim is Noah. But the evidence is that in the, the cosmology that they had of their gods, Utu was Ham. He was the son of Noah. And Utu Napishtim is almost certainly just a longer form of the name of Ham. And, and their name for Cush was Marduk, which means the bull calf of Utu or the firstborn son of Ham. So he goes and he finds Ham far away, and he brings back a new flood story, and the new flood story has now erased Jehovah. There's no mention of Huwawa in this story at all. The new gods, we have Anu as Noah, Enlil as Shem. Ham has three names, Enki, Ea, and Utu, and actually Chemosh would be four. And Niyama is now called Inanna or Ishtar or Ninsan. They had many names for her. And then in this section where we have the new story of the flood, at the end of the flood, Ea, who is in the name of Ham, he opens his mouth and he spoke to the warrior Enlil, who's Shem, wisest of the gods, hero Enlil, how could you so senselessly bring down the flood? Lay upon the sinner his sin, 
lay upon the transgressor his transgression. Punish him a little when he breaks loose. Don't drive him too hard or he perishes. Would that a lion had ravaged mankind rather than the flood. Would that a wolf had ravaged mankind rather than the flood. Would that famine had wasted the world rather than the flood. Would that pestilence had wasted mankind rather than the flood. And so he, they conclude the rebuke of the God who sent the flood. And then the new order has been established. So having brought back this new flood story and having rebuked the God who sent the flood, Gilgamesh dies. The king has laid himself down and will not rise again. The Lord of Kulab will not rise again. He overcame evil. He will not come again. Although he was strong of arm, he will not rise again. He had wisdom and a comely face. He will not come again. He is gone into the mountain. He will not come again. On the bed of fate he lies. He will not rise again. Front the couch of many colors. He will not come again. So, if anyone is an antichrist, Gilgamesh is the hero figure who does not rise again and who will not come again. Unlike Christ, who is the true promised seed of the woman, who did rise again and will come again. So, conclusions. When we see the biblical backstory for the Epic of Gilgamesh, it puts a whole different spin on the entire story. This is not just a silly Babylonian story about their version of the flood story. It, the whole work of the Epic of Gilgamesh appears to be, first, we killed Huawa, then we replaced Huawa as he's no longer the god who sent the flood, and then we managed to get in a, a good thorough rebuke of whoever did send the flood to make sure that everybody knows that that was a very bad thing to do. And that's the end of the story. So that concludes my lecture on the subject. I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Yes? Well, part of the problem is that we had the Tower of Babel and God confused the languages. And so you have one set of people who they're worshiping, but now those that set of gods has been multiplied into 20 different, lang- 20 different languages. And then this kingdom conquers that kingdom. And in the new unified kingdom, they now have the same god with two different names. So now they have uh, one temple to Ishtar of Nineveh and one temple to Ishtar of Uruk, who over time, their cults kind of fork. And next thing you know, they really are viewed as different goddesses, even though they both come from the same root. But yes, um, the only way to really do this is to reconstruct it. And in the 19th century, there was a lot of work done on this by Christian scholars. And then there was a guy named Alexander Hislop, who was a Presbyterian minister, who wrote a book called The Two Babylons. And he pieced a lot of this together, although he wasn't the first. It's, it's called Euhemerism, because Euhemerus, the Greek, around 600 B.C., wrote that, oh, 300 B.C., he wrote that the... Um, that the gods were just ancestors that we had been we had deified. So a number of people have worked on it and have looked at the names. For example, Anu and Oranus both appear to be based on Noah, as does Janus. Um, you can find the NU root in there. And he also, in all of these different um, theogenies, the Noah figure gets castrated by a son who is the ham figure. In the Greeks, the Greeks call him Kronos. The Hittites call him Kum Arbus, which is almost ham. It's almost literally his name. The, um, the Jews come right out and say it in, their, in the Midrash. They basically say that it was ham uh, who castrated Noah. They, they, that's what they say is what was being referred to by the nakedness, nakedness incident. And the Phoenicians also do it, and they refer to them as Oranos and Kronos, Kronos being the ham figure. So that is kind of like the, the peg. And then once you have that, they describe a number of fathers and sons, or you know, I guess relationships between the gods and what they've done. And there's a lot of inconsistencies. There's a lot of um, extra stuff that's been tacked on. So it's kind of like having to sift it down and take what you have two or three witnesses for and what you have left is probably pretty close to what actually happened. So.
Yes. On the names? Except for the Huwala. Except for Huwala. So it seems, am I wrong there, or is that really the crucial, is that really the crucial association? It is. Um, I'm not the first to say that. Uh, Dr. Livingston, who was the founder of the Associates for Biblical Research, he was a biblical scholar and archaeologist, and he he argued that in 2001. He also thought that Gilgamesh was Nimrod himself. Whereas I point, my reason for saying that, Nim, that Gilgamesh was the younger brother of Nimrod is because the Assyrians, the Greeks, the Egyptians, and the Sumerians all have Gilgamesh, or the Gilgamesh figure being one generation after the Nimrod figure. And so, um, and, one, and they named it Gilgamesh by name in two of those traditions. So it's close enough that we can say Gilgamesh was a real person. He was a king. He was a historical king. But he, he couldn't have been Nimrod because he's a generation after Ninus. And Ninus was Nimrod. So. Huawa. Livingston, Livingston argues that the interesting thing is in the extant copies of the Epic of Gilgamesh, it does not actually say who Wawa sent the flood. It, it, replaced, it basically says that Enlil sent the flood. It says Enlil sent the flood. There, there is no... So in the Sumerian pantheon, you have the god of heaven is Anu, and then he has sons, and his uh, son, of who is the god of the air, is named Enlil, who has blue eyes. And then the god of the sea is called Ea, or Enki, but he's also the sun god, Utu. They're kind of all three different aspects of the same guy. Enlil appears to be based on Shem, and Utu, Ea, Enki appear to be based on Ham, based on what they do. In fact, so um, we're told in one of them that the, that the figure uh, Marduk, or Belus, is the son of Utu. And in other places, he's associated with, with Enki or, or Ea. But the point is that um, you can see the biblical characters, but you... It takes a lot of interpretation to, to see it, and so it's not perfect. It's not something written in concrete. It takes a lot of interpretation. And the scholars of the 19th century pretty much believe this until Hislop wrote his book called The Two Babylons. And he made the argument pretty well, although he might have gone a bit further than the, the, the translations of the time would allow. But the reason he's been demonized is that his, the whole thesis of his book was that the Roman Catholic Church was worshiping Ishtar and Gilgamesh as the mother and the Madonna and child, that these old, these old um, Egyptian uh, idols of the mother goddess holding the baby Horus, I showed you one of them in one of the earlier slides. Let's see if I can find it. So he basically said this, the Roman Catholic Church has just um, relabeled this as Mary and Jesus. And in some points, I think he was probably right that some of the external icon and idol worship or the worship of images by the Roman Catholic Church, that they simply did relabel 
the old statues of the gods as Jesus and Mary and etc. But because of that, um, the Roman Catholics are very strongly represented in the world of academia. And the Jews are very strongly represented in the world of academia. But the Protestants, not as much. And because Hislop's two Babylons was also kind of into the worldy, um, meaning viewing the Pope as the Antichrist, I think that um, academia kind of pushed that whole thing away. And so where Hislop was probably right about most of the humorism, the, the connections that he was making of the identities of these people, those have kind of been tossed out because we're not comfortable, or at least the academic world is not comfortable with um, a thesis, which basically is really a religious screed against the Pope. So that would be my explanation. You look shocked. <laughs> Any other questions? I did warn you all this one was dark. Yes. Islam has this interesting story that the uh, Kaaba or Kaaba, whatever it's uh, called, uh, this is a meteorite. Is that possibly the same meteorite that they were possibly referring to? Because well, we also have the story of Job: uh, stones fall from heaven and kill his cattle. Sure. We have Joshua: stones fall from heaven and kill the Canaanites. We have a whole lot of stones falling from heaven in Sodom and Gomorrah. So those first few centuries after the flood, my, my hypothesis would be that the debris from the flood floating around the solar system is colliding, with, some of it's colliding with the earth, and providentially God timed it at specific events to achieve his purposes. If um, the Kaaba is a meteorite, one that was that could cause a seven-year famine would be something like a mile, a huge comet hitting the ocean or, or, or kicking, kicking up so much ash. It could also have been a volcano. Um, the problem is we're guessing, but we know that they thought it had something to do with this constellation Taurus, which strongly suggests that it probably was either a meteorite, asteroid, or a comet from the Taurid stream, but probably not the Kaaba. It wasn't big enough, but maybe it could be a piece. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks, everybody.